Luke chapter 10, look with me at verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So we see here the story of two sisters, Mary and Martha, in this one house. It says in that first verse we talked about there in verse 38, that Martha was the one that received Christ in. And it says in verse 39 that Mary, the sister of Martha, which also there sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So it seemed like, at least for a moment in time, that they were both at Jesus' feet. But it's revealed that Martha cumbered about much serving. So she's up and she's down and she's up and she's down. Whether we do it Physically, or whether we do it mentally, I think sometimes when we're hearing the teachings of the Word of God, we do the same thing. We're in and out and in and out, thinking about the week ahead, thinking about, you know, what happened uh, this week past, daydreaming, as it were. <clears throat> but it says here that Mary hath chosen that good part, and her good part there was to sit at Jesus' feet. And verse 39, it says, hear his words, and she heard his word. So she seems focused. She seems attentive to what Christ there is teaching. And as we walk through this teaching, we want to find ourselves in that good part. Attentive, at his feet, hearing his word. Not just today, of course, but all the time. Whenever the word of God is being preached or spoken of, we need to be ready. Go to Matthew chapter 5. We need to be ready to hear as we're abiding beneath the teaching of his word. Follow me to his feet, we'll talk about today. Last week, we were following Christ to the common people, which is where he began his ministry. But now in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, we find one of Jesus' lengthiest and perhaps even most famous sermons, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll just walk through this and get some of that teaching as we abide at Christ's feet. Try to be attentive, try to hear, not necessarily what I'm saying today, but let's hear the Word of God. Look there in Matthew chapter 5. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and the sermon begins. So, we saw that as he went about healing the sick and those that were possessed with the devils, he accumulated a big multitude. A big following came from those that were cast away by the general populace, or they were average at best. Just, just your general folks, the poor, the Bible talks about them in other places, though not all of them were necessarily poor, middle class perhaps, just the general people. Great multitudes, the previous chapter, verse 25 says, came from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan to hear. Now, verse 1 of chapter 5, Jesus sees the multitudes and his response is, went up into a mountain. So what I think is happening here is essentially he's thronged by such a massive group of people that he's been healing and taking care for and loving and preaching the gospel to and all of these things that Christ would do in his ministry. But he sees them and he leaves up into a mountain, I believe is what happened. Because it says here, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And now it says, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying. So I believe what's happening here is that he fled from the multitudes up into a mountain, got set and ready for what he was about to preach unto his disciples. It says the disciples came and he taught them, 
with an open mouth. So I believe that this is primarily a teaching to the disciples. What likely would have happened is that the multitudes kind of found him and continued to throng him sort of as the sermon was going on. But initially, and in the context of what we're learning about here, it's a teaching to disciples. So if you want to be a fisher of men, you've got to follow Christ. And I believe what we're learning about in these next five chapters, or three chapters, is following Christ to his feet to learn from his teaching in particular. Because this is exactly what the context is revealing to us. Look at verse 2. And taught them. So following Christ involves being taught and instructed by Christ. Amen? So this is what we want to get out of here. So let's just walk through some of the teachings that Christ is trying to highlight. Remember, this is immediately after he talked to his disciples and said, follow me as he was picking them. And he showed them how he ministers to the people. Now he's furthermore saying, follow me and learn something here. Verse three, it said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Here a teaching is what it takes to be blessed. Not how you get blessed, but what's re- what, what is the classification or what is the characteristic of those that in fact are blessed. Here they're poor in spirit. In other words, they always need more spiritual nourishments. Are we there? They are mourning. In other words, they're not always rejoicing and celebrating, but often they're mourning. Quite often that could be for the spiritual needs that are around you and whatnot. Theirs is the kingdom of God, the poor, and they shall be comforted, those that mourn. Blessed are the meek. In other words, those that are strong, but they're not loud. They're not boisterous in their strength. Rather, Though meekness is not weakness, meekness is when you have strength, but you reserve it for a particular time and a place. You're blessed if you're somebody like that, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and always trying to walk and talk and act and behave more like Christ would have you to behave. You're blessed if that's you. The merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers called the children of God and blessed in that. If you continue on in verse 10, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In other words, when you're persecuted because you're behaving right and righteously, that's a blessed position to be in. Yours is the kingdom of heaven, Christ here says. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. But look what it says. Falsely, when you are spoken evil against falsely for the name of Christ. In other words, if somebody talks bad about you because you've done something wrong, you're not blessed in that, of course, that you had it coming. But if somebody speaks evil against you and it's false, you're blessed in that position. And for the name of Christ's sake, even more so. Rejoice, verse 12 says, and I know it's hard to do. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So now he's telling his disciples, hey, people are going to revile you, hate you, persecute you for my name's sake, but hey, you're in good company. Amen? You are in a position that the prophets that went before you stood in. You're in good company. You're in good terms with God. You're blessed, and you ought to rejoice. When these things are happening to you because of all of these things that we see before. It's your kingdom of heaven. You're comforted. You shall inherit the years. You shall obtain mercy if you're merciful. Called the children of God are those that fall into this category. Now continuing on in the same vein of being a fisher of men. Remember this is the context. Christ wants to show them and lead them, and all they have to do is follow, and they will become fishers of men. Look what he talks about in verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Okay? So what is salt? Well, it it gives flavor, right? You can take something that's bland and add salt, and it tastes a little bit better, doesn't it? It brings out flavor. Salt's also a preservative. All these different things you can look at in the study of what salt is, and in fact, at this time, and you know, there may come a time in the future... Salt was one of the most price, pricey 
commodities that existed. Why? Because you could use it for all sorts of things. You could use it for healing. You could use it for preservation. You could use it for flavor. It was, it was, a, it was a very rich commodity, salt. If you think about it, what good is a clump of gold if, if, if money faileth, all right? It doesn't really matter a whole lot, but salt has so many uses. And he says here, ye are the salt of the earth. Good for worlds of things and different, different methods and different things you can use salt for. It says this, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. While there's so many uses for salt, if it loses its flavor, if it goes stale, if it's no good anymore, it's no better than the sand that you're walking on. It might as well just be scattered upon the earth and you just walk across it. It's good for nothing, trodden under the foot of men. So you need to be salt that has savor. You need to be salt that is, is, is ready and able to fulfill its purpose. Apply that to being a fisher of men. Be ready and able to fulfill your purpose as the salt of the earth. Look at verse 14. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So you are a light that is set up above all and cannot be hid, right? You think about when you approach a city, quite often, even though the hills are rolling up to it, and you can't see the city per se on the horizon, usually you'll see the orange glow or the yellow glow of that city far before you can ever see that city. Why? Because it's essentially, in a lot of ways, set up on a hill giving light unto all. And that's what the Christian ought to be. You're the light of the world. As a city that is set on a hill, it cannot be hid. Verse 15 says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. It giveth light unto all that are in the house. Nobody lights a candle and then hides it under something. That's going to be dangerous, first and foremost. But it's also not fulfilling its purpose. The purpose is to light the room. And you know what? One little candle can not only light a whole room, it can give warmth to a whole room. It can even raise the room a few degrees. It's amazing what candles can do. Just one little light, we ought to be so. One little light is what you are to this world, giving warmth, giving light unto a dark place. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. There's a practical application. So let your light shine like a city set on a hill. Let your light shine like it's on a candlestick that they may, who the world may, see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is why ye are salt of the world. This is why you are light to this world, so that you can bring glory unto your Father which is in heaven. Fulfill that purpose. Christ is preaching to his disciples at this time. Now continue on, verse 17. And I'm just going to whip through this and just talk about a few points, because we got a whole sermon to get through here. Verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least of the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now look at those that are doing the commandments and those that are not doing the commandments. Where are they both abiding? The kingdom of heaven, right? In other words, we're not saved by the works that we're doing. The jots and the tittles of the law. They're there to fulfill a purpose, amen? They're there to guide us into all truth. They're there to show us that right and good way. To show us what's right and what's wrong. And, and how to please God and how to follow and serve God. That's what the law is there for. But Christ here is saying that he has fulfilled the law. He's coming not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. That's his purpose. In other words, Christ's goal is to fulfill the law in completeness. And when he died on the cross, he had fulfilled the law in completeness. As far as being righteous servant and, and fulfilling different prophecies and what have you. He succeeded 100% in our goal, but that doesn't mean that these are gone away. Verse 18 clearly says, till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one till shall in no wise pass from this law until all of it be fulfilled. Okay, so that fulfillment will come at such a time when every jot and every tittle, every cross of a T and dot of an I will be fulfilled in what the law says in its fullness. Now, we are to follow these commandments. Amen. Verse 19 then gives a classification of two people. Those that are breaking the commandments and also teaching men to do so. 
shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But those that are doing and teaching them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, are these all prophets, do you think? Do you think everybody's just actively breaking the commandments and then telling other people, hey, you know what, you should go and steal? I mean, I don't think so. Why? Because these are kingdom of heaven folk. These are Christians. He's talking to disciples at this time. But you know what preaches more than our mouth? Our actions. We don't talk to everybody out in the street, but everybody out in the street can look upon us, behold our actions, just as a light in the world, a city set on a hill, just as a light, a candle put on a candlestick, giving light to all the house. Your light shining before men can show people the light, the way, the truth, what's righteous, or it can also be a dimness in the world, can it? People can see you as a light of the world and be like, you know what? I don't want to be anything like these Christians. They're rotten people. They're good for nothing. They break all of their own commandments. What in the world? And you don't even have to speak to teach men to do so. They simply look at somebody who says they are righteous, says they're a believer in Christ, and they see your example, and they'll follow after it. Your children will follow after your example. People that are younger than you will follow after your example. Your co-workers, your family members, your loved ones will all follow after your example. And in doing wrong, breaking commandments, sometimes you don't even have to say a word. You're teaching men to do so. And the Bible says you'll be least in the kingdom of heaven as a result. But look at this. Whosoever shall, I love this, do and teach them, you'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You need to do and you need to teach. In other words, you can't have one or the other. You can't be teaching people but not doing. You'll be a hypocrite. You ought not be doing but not teaching. You're simply somebody that's put their light under a bushel, hid it under a bed, right? We need to be both doing righteousness, following the commands of God, and also teaching others. Be seen of others when you do right. Not to gain glory, but to glorify God. Show people the right example and that right and good way is the goal here. And that's what he's saying to his disciples. You want to be a fisher of man? Don't be a hypocrite. Do and teach. You want to, you want to catch men from this day henceforth? Be that light of the world. Be that city set on a hill that cannot be hid. And be a good example as you're doing that. Verse 20 says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here he's just giving an example of the scribes and Pharisees who outwardly looked like they were a great example unto the public, but they of course weren't because inwardly they were dead men's bones. But he's just highlighting that, hey, if you don't have a righteousness like that, what, what can you even hope to achieve here as a believer? In other words, they're unbelievers and they're living a certain way. You as a believer ought to have a higher standard and have a higher appeal to the unbelievers that look upon you. You ought to be a bright light shining in dark places. Verse 21 of Matthew chapter 5, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Here Christ is going to talk about the, Ye have heard that it hath been said, and now what I say. So he's just going to keep highlighting this in various different ways. They said, I think the transition was the Pharisees here, They've taken the law and they've bent it to their own self-righteous ways. Some of these are good commandments. Thou shalt not kill. That's clearly one of the commandments, isn't it? And that's true. Thou shalt not do no murder. He says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, thou shalt not kill. He says in Matthew chapter 19 verse 18, do no murder when he reiterates that, that, that uh, command. But Christ takes it to another level when he says in verse 22, but I say unto you. So, it's one thing to just kill nobody. And for a lot of us, I think that's pretty easy. I mean, I don't generally find myself tempted to murder people. I don't, I don't, I've been mad at people, but, I, but this is what Christ is dealing with now. Is it enough to just keep the law, don't commit adultery? Is it enough to just keep the law, don't murder, right? And then we're like, okay, good, we're righteous. Or is there something more to the teaching of the jots and tittles of the Old Testament? Christ here is going to say, hey, there's something more to it. But I say unto you, verse 22, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, and he continues on. Now what is he saying here? He's saying, it's one thing to say, hey, 
I don't kill my brother, so I'm a pretty good person. But Christ is bringing it to a spiritual truth and a deeper understanding of what he's trying to say here. And he says, hey, if you're angry with your brother, you're in danger of being judged. He says, if you say to your brother, Raka, or just like a, a curse unto them, you're in danger of the council. If you say, thou fool, in other words, call your brother an idiot or, or, a, or a fool or, or you're a dummy, what is wrong with you? You're in danger of hellfire. The judgment and wrath of God coming upon you, not your eternal soul, of course, but certainly the fullness of his anger when he sees brethren attacking people like that. So Christ's higher way then in verse 23 continues. He says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. He's saying that if I remember as I'm coming to do service, as I'm coming to do sacrifice, as I'm coming to leave a gift before the altar, if I remember that a brother of mine, another believer, has something against me, maybe I've done something, maybe I didn't do something, but he's offended by me, I should leave my gift and go try to be reconciled with him. In other words, it's more important, more important than being religious, following the jots and tittles, is our relationship one with another. And Christians have forgotten that, haven't we? We've forgotten the fact that we are to be one body and we are to be serving one God, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, united in that common belief, and yet we fight amongst each other more than anybody else. We're one of the worst groups for infighting and bickering and, and, and brawling and, and, and railing on each other. And Christ here is saying, if you call your brother an idiot, hellfire is coming. I'm, I'm angry at that. I, I'm going to come down in the fullness of my anger upon you for that unrighteous attitude calling another Christian a fool, an idiot, right? It doesn't, it, it's unbecoming. Not only that, it's more important than just your jots and your tittles and your little offering and sacrifice that you bring unto me. Go be reconciled unto your brother, Christ is saying here. And all of this is, again, highlighting how we ought to behave as fishers of men before Christ. Now, he says, verse 25, Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, thou shalt by no means come out, till, come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. You know what he's saying? Let some things slide. Agree with your adversary quickly, otherwise you're going to find yourself before the judge, before the officer, cast into prison. A whole world of hurt and troubles can come because you just didn't agree with your adversary. You know that saying? We, we ought not to just have this attitude where we're always right, and i got to make sure everybody knows that I'm always right, and I always have to no, just you let something slide. Okay, is that really worth fighting for? Is that really worth, you know, dying on that hill? Is it worth going to the judge, the officer, cast into prison, all these things that can come, just because I didn't let something slide, a little disagreement between brothers? No, it's usually not worth letting it go. Verse 27, it says, Ye have heard that it was said in them in old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So, just not committing adultery on your wife. Is that such a challenging command? A lot of people have no problems with that. They don't struggle with that, right? Right? In a certain circumstance, men could find themselves in that. But generally, most people aren't always in circumstances where, where you know, adultery can happen. What am I saying? People don't just trip and fall into adultery. 99% of the time, it doesn't happen that way. And so he's saying, hey, you can keep that letter of the law. You, you don't commit adultery. Good for you, okay? But I say unto you, verse 28, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now there's the challenge, right? For men, the eyes are obviously and automatically attracted to women, okay? This is in us in order so that we can find one that we like, marry her, and then we can go on and create children as a result of that. There's nothing wrong with men being attracted to women. But... It ought to get to the point where marriage happens, and then that's your only one. You chose her, you're married to her, and your eyes ought be only for her. The problem so many men fall into, though, is they're not committing adultery, certainly, but their eyes are wandering this way and that. And it's even encouraged in this world. If, if I don't know, I've, I've been in auto mechanic shops, and you know what? You often see the picture of the... Uh, 
the bikini babe, right? And then, then men are looking at that and oogly and they all get together and they're like, oh, look at that one, great. That's just part of our culture. People say all these, all the time, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dead yet. I can still look. You know, these, these sayings that men have come up with to legitimize and, and okay, stamp of approval on the looking. But Christ is saying here, it's no different. It's adultery in your heart. You've already committed adultery simply by looking. And this is another thing that is serious. As serious as calling your brother an idiot and having hellfire the result. He, look at it, he says in verse 29, this is serious. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body be cast into hell. In other words, it's so serious that if your eyes are causing you to look and lust, you might as well just pluck that thing out. Because it's, it's, you'll be more benefited losing that eye than to suffer the judgment that's going to come upon you for committing adultery repeatedly in your heart. And this is what Christ is saying. Teaching to believers, of course, these, the, the, the depth and importance of doing and teaching, being righteous, walking righteous, serving him righteously, and not letting just your ability to keep the letter of the law stand in the way of you actually achieving greater things in the Christian of life, in the Christian life. You want to be a fisher of men? There's important teaching here. Sit at Christ's feet and learn. Verse 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Okay, he says, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save him for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever marry shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So Christ here is just highlighting that, that divorce is not like the Pharisees teach it, where it's just any cause. I'm just going to put her away. He's saying, hey, one man, one woman, and we've talked about this before. We're not going to go into it in depth, but this is one thing, our marital status and how, how strong our marriage is actually, I believe, plays into the type of fisher of men, the type of Christian believer that's producing fruit, you will be. This is important stuff. Verse 33. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. But I say unto you, swear it all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You know what he's saying? Let your word be good. Let your word be good enough. If you're going to, someone asks you, will you do something? And you say yes, it's a yes, you follow through. Do and teach. Show that example. If you say no, it should be no. Leave it alone. Because that's what Christ here is highlighting. Don't forswear thyself. Don't make great oaths. I swear to God I will do this for you. I swear on Jerusalem. I, I swear on my mother's grave. I will, it, it, it's not necessary. As a believer, as, as, a, as a righteous follower of Christ, you ought to be somebody that, that people know you by your word. Yeah, he said he'd do it. He'll be here. And they can count on that every time, all the time. Verse 38, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn unto him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give unto him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. In other words, it's not tit for tat in this life, but we ought to be giving. We ought to be forgiving. We ought to be people that that relinquish our rights in, in some circumstances. In other words, he had no right to sue me at the law. Well, is it a big deal? No. He just wants your coat. Okay. Have my cloak also. He had no right to ask me to come and do this thing for me, and, and he wanted me to drive a mile with him, and, and now he owes me. It's tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. No, just go to with him. Go twain miles with him and, 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 and just give. Be giving. That's what, that's what he's highlighting here. Verse 43, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But we dealt with this the other week. But he says, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. And, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's amazing how people talk about, Oh, he, he used me. He took advantage of me. And he just wanted to benefit from me. Well, the Bible says pray for him. 
Don't get angry about it. Don't 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 out don't lash out. Don't make a big deal about the fact that you've been used and you're that's just pride. Just go to your closet and pray for the people that you think have taken advantage of you and you have used you. I think God will remind you that He's given you everything that you have. So why would you think that, oh, somebody's benefiting and taking advantage of it? People ought to benefit from you. Christ gives to somebody so that others would benefit from it. Remember, you're the light of the world. He makes you a light, has you illuminated, doesn't he? He gave you that gift so that you would shed abroad that light into everyone that enters into that house. This is all part of loving your enemies, blessing them that curse you, doing good to them that hate you, praying for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You're not that important. You're not a big deal. You're not great so that you ought to always have everybody love you and everybody do good to you. No, but you can certainly turn that around and love other people and bless other people and give them appropriately what God highlights here, love, blessing, good, well-doing, praying for those, that ye may be, verse 45, the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same, verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What is he saying here? He's saying be like God. Love as God loved. You know, as, as Christ was being spat and mocked and ridiculed and beaten, he didn't say, you guys used me. You just wanted to take into heaven. You just wanted some miracle. You just wanted me to heal you. No, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. They know what they do. Right? He was hated by those that he did good unto. The Bible says he went about doing good. And those people that received the benefit of that put him on the cross. They cursed him. They cast the same in his, out of the, in his teeth, these, these mockings and curses. And he blessed them by dying on the cross and giving them provision so that they could go to heaven. Be as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And the perfect example that we have of the Father which is in heaven is his Christ child that came and walked down here before us and set us an example. And it's the same Christ that we are now sitting at his feet and being taught of, learning from. Follow me, he said, and I will make you fishers of men. And what's he going to do? He's going to point you to the Father, to his word, and he's going to teach you to follow in the Father's word. Continuing on, verse 1 of chapter 6, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. What's the reward? The glory of men. If you want to do good deeds that have glory of men, there you go, you have it. Isn't that wonderful? They clap for you. Those same people that will glorify you for your good works, Next, they might hate you, just so you know. It doesn't always just stay that way. And so there's your reward. If you wanted a reward that lasted for 20 minutes, you know, I, I say this sometimes at work, you're only as good as your last success. In other words, I come to work, I do a really good job. They're like, that's great. If I come to work the next day and stink, all of those good things that I did were forgotten because today I stunk at my job, right? So that's what we got to remember too is the same case. If you want glory of men, you can have it. There's your reward. But, verse 3, it says, When thou doest thine alms, or thy giving, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in what? Secret. That thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. I would rather have the reward of the Father than have accolades from hundreds of men. Okay, because that reward openly given of the Father, you know that it's done righteously. You know that it serves the right purpose. You know that it's the measure of what you have done. You're not getting, you know, accolades that you didn't deserve. You're not getting things that would puff you up. You're not having people being nice to you and rejoicing over you simply because you've done right in, unto them. But Father justly gives. And if you go to him in secret, performing your alms in secret, he will reward thee openly. In other words, anything good that we do for God, just be humble about it. It's not like when the offering box goes around, you putting your money in, you're giving, your alms is not being done in secret. You're not letting your left hand know what their right hand doeth. You know what that means? That means you, you, you take and you, you kind of just give. You, you do it subtly, you do it quietly. You're doing it before men, but you're not doing it for to be seen of men. What would the opposite be if you're like, 
do, 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 sound the trumpet, bring the money out. Maybe you have one of those checks that's like the size of the, the pulpit and it's written on it how much you've given and you want everybody to see as you're parading it across the stage and celebrating. That's doing your alms for to be seen of men. You have your reward if you do that. You get the picture with the big check and everyone celebrates you for that one day. But the man that just subtly gives, quietly gives unto God and, and, and in his service, his alms will be rewarded openly of the Father as he does it in secret. So don't do things to be showy. Don't do things be seen of men. And when, verse 5, thou prayest, be not as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Do you see a theme here? When you're doing your alms, do it in secret. When you're praying, do it in secret. Not to be seen of men. Verse 6, but when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, the giving, the praying, and what you do in service unto God, when you do it quietly, God will reward thee openly. When ye pray, verse 7, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. If you're doing repetitions, you've either memorized it or you've got it written down. Prayer unto God should be from your heart. It should be just talking with your Father which is in heaven. So here Christ, he just finished saying, don't use vain repetitions. But now he's going to say in verse 9, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. He's going to continue off after the manner of this prayer. Not in the, in the exact wording of this prayer. Not as the hypocrites do, as the Catholics would do. And they would just take this and memorize it. Protestants do the same thing and they just, oh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, 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 no. This is a manner for prayer. Not a vain repetition that we use as a prayer. So what does this mean to me? I think it's just a model prayer that you could take all the types, all the stanzas, all of the sentences, and use them in your prayer life to kind of guide you along as you pray. It gives you a format to pray in. Our Father, which art in heaven, giving glory to him, hallowed be thy name, rejoicing in his name, Jesus, that came and, and died for us, and who he is as the Holy One of Israel. Thy kingdom come, praying that his kingdom would come on this earth. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Above all, you want God's will to be done. Just kind of things that come to your mind as you, yes, have memorized this portion of scripture, but you're just using it to guide you in your prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Ask for daily provisions from him. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, forgive us where we have fallen short and we're needy and needed to borrow, but also forgive the debtors, those that have lent unto us. In another place in Luke, it talks about that being iniquities. Forgive us our iniquities and our sins as we forgive those that have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, don't be just making every day for me, Lord, one temptation after another. Deliver me from evil. Deliver me from hurt and harm. Keep me, Lord, for thy Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And you just say, you know what, God? It's all yours. You're in charge. You're the boss. You are in control of all these things. The power, the glory all belongs to you. And you finish it off with a good hearty amen. And that's a model for prayer that you could use. And you could spend time in each part of this just using that as a guideline for you. That's what Christ is teaching. It's not a vain repetition. It's a manner. It's a model of prayer. Verse 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's reaping what you sow, right? Reap in mercy, and you'll receive mercy. I like that study that Brother Sampson shared with us. You reap, you reap what you sow in all manners of life. So if you want mercy, be merciful. If you want to be forgiven, be a forgiving person. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Verse 16, moreover, when ye fast... Now, what do you think he's going to talk about here? Don't do it publicly. Don't do it to be seen of men. Don't do it in order to have reward of men. Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. When you're fasting, it's because you are really in, in contrition of spirit. You really want to get hold of God. You want more power. You want a more direct line to God. You're afflicting yourself in order to have access to God. Not so that men can look at you and say, oh, look how holy and sanctimonious he is. He's, he's fasting. He's really suffering, you know. You don't need to do a black mark on your forehead so that everybody knows that you're fasting. You're seen of men. Wow, that's so glorious. If that's what you want as your reward, you can have it. But if you really 
a hold of God and move the heavens in your favor and you're fasting in order to get that, then hey, wash your face, clean your hair, look normal, act normal, and just go about your day and your reward will be great in heaven. Verse 17, but when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. There's a theme here, and if you're a fisher of men, you're not a hypocrite. You're not doing it for to be seen of men. If you want souls to be saved, you're not doing it so that you can check a box. I know that we count, we do that to motivate ourselves to do greater works and to, and to do more things. But if I ever thought that this was turning into some sort of woohoo checklist being seen of men and rejoicing in all the wonderful works that we are done because our numbers are going up and up and up, then I would just stop counting. Because we're not doing whatever we do to be seen of men. We're doing it to be seen of God in secret. So we can be rewarded openly. Verse 19, lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, lay up eternal rewards by doing righteous deeds that are spiritually significant. And that's where your heart is and that's where your treasure would be. Where is your treasure? There your heart is also. Verse 22, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if thine eye be single, thy body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And that's a result of hypocrisy. That's the result of doing light, doing good to be seen of men, and then the light, the good that is in you, if that's just a dark thing, if that's just hypocrisy, if that's just you trying to have glory of men, how dark is that? that that's, that's the darkest of dark is those that would appear righteous on the outside, but inwardly they are full of dead men. Both inwardly they are dark and they're doing it for the wrong purpose. That's what I see. The light of the body is the eye. If thine eye be single, that whole body shall be full of light. If you're focused on what? Laying up treasures in heaven, doing things to benefit heaven and not benefit yourself. But again, if you're doing it for the wrong purpose, if you're doing it to benefit yourself and have glory of this earth, that's a dark thing. That's not a righteous or a right thing. Verse 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, how they sow not. Neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He's highlighting having faith in God. You can't serve two masters. You can't be trying to serve yourself and serve the kingdom of this world and also being servitude unto God. you got to choose. Are you going to serve God or are you are going to serve mammon? Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he's saying, look, if you choose to serve me, I'll care for you like the sparrows. They're not sowing and reaping these fowls. They're not gathering into barns and caring for treasures on this earth. And you're much better than them, and I care for them. He's saying, I will feed you. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto your stature? Can you make yourself taller? Can you make yourself shorter? Can you do miracles like that? No. So then why are you taking thought for your raiment? Verse 28. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto one of these. In other words... The littlest things in this world God cares for like we can't even understand. We look at Solomon and we're like, wow, look, he's blessed God. And God's like, you know what? I care for these lilies more than I ever cared for Solomon. And yet you see that and you see this and you don't understand why I can't take care of you. God is promising provision, but what does it take to receive that permit? provision. Verse 30, wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye little of faith? If you have faith, God will provide for you and care for those things. Don't be worrying about all of these things. Don't be worrying about gathering to yourself treasures on earth. Have faith in God and let him care for you. Therefore, verse 31, take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? You know what? We're entering a, t a day and time that 
if things happen the way our imaginations tend to run or the way, you know, the doomsday, you know, prognosticators say it's going to happen, we may find ourselves in a scenario where we're wondering what are we going to eat? We're wondering what we're going to drink. We're wondering how we're going to be clothed because things are just so bad. You know, depressions and recessions are nothing new. In our generation, those of us that are sitting here today in, in this country, we haven't seen something like that, but our grandparents certainly did. You know, our grandparents' generation saw two wars and two depressions, and, and we've never experienced that. But you know what? They went through times where they were probably wondering to themselves, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What are we going to put on? If they had faith in God, there would be no worries whatsoever. He's caring for even the grass of the field. He will care for you if you have faith. Okay? For all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, seek first the kingdom. Seek first God's glory. Seek first what's benefiting him and his righteousness which comes from the jots and the tittles and following the law. And all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, if you're living righteously and you have faith, God will take care of you. Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient to the day of the evil thereof. In verse 1 of chapter 7, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. Okay? Just a little bit of a, 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 a kickback to what we talked about in Luke chapter 10. How many of us are like Martha right now as we're reading through the Bible? As our brain's in and out? Is our focus here and there? Are we cumbered about with much busyness? No one's gotten up and left and went about to, to serve or do anything like that. But certainly our minds can do that as Christ is teaching really important things to us here. He continues on. He says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So this is a matter that is brought up by a lot of people where they just say, judge not, judge not, judge not. In other words, never condemn me if I'm doing something wrong biblically. But Christ here is saying that with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So what is he talking about? Well, he just talked about doing and teaching, so not being a hypocrite. And that's been a highlight of what he's talking about throughout these first two chapters that we looked at. Not being a hypocrite, doing what you're saying, following through, being a righteous person. And if you're judging, then don't be beholding a little moat or a little speck that is in your brother's eye while you have a giant beam in your own eye. Can you imagine somebody coming to somebody with a huge log hanging out of their eye and being like, hang on, you got a little something there in your eye. He would be like, this is crazy. What is he talking about? How is he going to cast out that little moat in my eye when he's got this? Well, what God is saying here is that you're a hypocrite. If you have this giant sin in your life, but you're looking around at everybody else trying to pick on their little measly sins. And if you're going to judge people that way, then don't be surprised when, jo when God measures unto you that same judgment back. If you're harsh and hurtful and, and problematic to people as you judge them in hypocrisy, then hey, when God decides he's going to judge you for that same beam that is in your own eye, it's going to be harsh, it's going to be without mercy, and it's going to be quick and swift and hurtful and harmful unto you, even as you've treated others. Verse 4, How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold... A beam is in thine own eye. Now watch this. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. In other words, first deal with your own house. First deal with your own sin. First deal with your own problems and your own shortcomings and your own transgressions against the holy God. Then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. In other words, if you're judging a mote in somebody's eye, there ought to be nothing similar to that in your own eye and in your own life. If you're judging somebody for such and such a sin, trying to help them even, trying to point out their faults, trying to judge them, 
And you better make sure your life is clean because God will turn that judgment back on you. And how you judge is just as important as the judgment that is made. You know, people will just say, you know, I'm just, I'm just judging righteously, but they're, they're doing it mean and cruel and vindictive and not to benefit somebody or to help a brother out and get them back on the right path. No, they're doing it to hurt and shame and harm and demean somebody and bully them. That, just don't be surprised when that same judgment comes upon you, thou hypocrite. Christ here says. Verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before in swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. There's a time and a place to give holy things unto people. And if you're just casting them before dogs and swine and people that don't want to hear it and don't really have any intentions of change, whatever it is, you need to have a time and a place to give people righteousness a judgment or, a, or a, a, a Bible verse or something that is holy. Verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son shall ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore... All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law of the prophets. Known also as the golden rule, do unto others as you would want to be treat, do, done unto you. Treat others as you would like to be treated. And again, that, that transcends what we just talked about with judgment. How do you want to be judged? You know, when I am doing something wrong, do I want Brother Yuri to just come up here and lambast me in front of everybody like, you did this wrong and you're, you know, thou fool, you idiot. And just, just, this was so wicked and wrong and everybody, you know, and just call attention to it. Is that how he would want to be treated when someone went wrong? No, he would probably want somebody to pull him aside and quietly show him, hey, this is wrong and you need to get this right and judge righteously, but with the right heart and with the right mentality. <clears throat> Verse 13, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And I believe this applies practically both to salvation and also to our sanctification life. There is a wide gate of flesh and sin and unrighteousness that the Christian can follow down to satisfy and gratify and please themselves. And that is not the way of life. That is not the way that leadeth unto life and life everlasting and life eternal. In other words, the Christ life, the crucified life, the blessed life in this world when God is really using you and really, really doing great things in your life. No, that is destruction. We need to follow that narrow way. And what is the narrow way? Well, that's where Christ is leading. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me in the way. Follow me in the word. Follow me in what I am teaching you is what Christ is constantly affirming and highlighting to us. It's a straight gate. Wide is where destruction is. And you know what? It's easy to take that wide road, isn't it? It's a lot harder to take that narrow road. That's why it's so easy for us to fall into sin and transgressions, moment by moment, day by day. If we're not following Christ, we will always just end up following ourselves, serving ourselves, following the world, following friends that draw us away from the true and good way. We need to be focused. We need to be diligent. Verse 15 says, beware of false prophets. Same thing. Be focused. Be diligent. Don't be easily deceived. It says, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. In other words, these false prophets look pretty. They look right. They look Christian. They look like sheep, but inwardly there are ravening wolves waiting to destroy the very sheep that they are drawing away. It says, you shall know them by their fruits. You shall know them by what they produce. You shall know them by, by what comes out of them. You shall know them by their words and by their deeds and by, by what they do. You should, you'll be able to tell a wolf from a sheep just because it's got sheep clothing on. They've got a manner about them, don't they? They walk a certain way. They talk a certain way. They behave a certain way. They howl a certain way. They don't act like sheep, even though they might look like sheep. And this is what the Bible here is saying. Beware of them. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. 
but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And we need to be conscious of the fruit that is coming from the prophets of this world. The best bet is to just go to the prophets in the Bible. The law and the prophets will never steer you away. So when somebody comes to you and says something, prophecy-wise, preaching-wise, teaching-wise, double-check with the Bible. If they're saying, lines up with the Bible, and not just your interpretation or your thing, but if it's generally just, hey, that's Bible, that's Scripture, then, then they're leading you in the right direction. They're leading you in that straight gate. Continuing on, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. John 6.40 says, This is the will of him that sent me, and that's that all men would believe. We know that. So doing the will of God is believing on him, is showing faith in him and trusting in him. Not just saying, Lord, Lord, in some vain show. Oh, I'm a Christian. Lord, Lord, I, I believe in Jesus. Lord, Lord. No, but have you believed on Christ? Are you believing on Christ even today in your walk? Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And this is a great verse for those that nominal Christians, or those that say, I'm a believer, or whatsoever, or those that are trusting in their works. Because it's highlighting that it's the will of the Father which is important, and that's faith in Christ. But these are saying, Lord, Lord, we've done works. Lord, Lord, we've done good things. Lord, Lord. And Christ just says, I never knew you. Not I used to know you and then I just threw you away. No, I never knew you. There was a never a time when I as Christ or I as the Father knew you. That's what God here is saying to the worker of iniquity that is trying to work their way into good favor with God, into the kingdom of heaven. Those religious folks, Lord, Lord shall not enter in if they're not trusting in that Lord that they profess to call upon. Verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. And this is great. He's wrapping up that whole sermon, all that he's been talking about. Because remember, he started off saying, do and teach. Hear and do. Like He wants you to apply what's coming out right now. He wants you to be like Mary, at his feet, hearing the word of God. And then he expects that Mary would get up and apply it. Not like Martha does, where she's not really hearing the word of God. She's distracted, but she's cumbered about with much busyness and much works and much, you know, serving. But she missed the mark. She, Christ here says, therefore, whosoever shall hear these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. You want to be a wise man, a wise woman today? Hear the sayings and do them. Hear them and do them. Hear them and do them. And you'll be likened unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. Trouble entered into their life. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. That rock was Christ. The Bible says in many places, found your life, place your life, place your trust, place everything you do on him, and you will not be moved. Verse 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto the foolish man which built his house upon sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it what is christ saying do it what i'm saying what i'm teaching just do it just obey hear these sayings and do them you'll be likened unto a wise man and you shall not fall it fell not for it was founded upon a rock and that's how he fin finishes that whole teaching that's how he finishes that whole sermon that he had said is basically You've heard what I've said. You've heard the word. Now do it. Get up and go and do it. Follow me in this area. Follow Jesus. Learn from the word. Learn from his authority. Be taught of him. That's another step in being a fisher of men. Verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. 
it's, it's astonishing the words that come from Christ. And obviously we just ripped through this as fast as we can and just talked about minor points. Perhaps when Christ presented this, it was much longer. Maybe he dealt with each of these topics a little bit more specifically. But it says here that the people were astonished at his doctrine. I think even as you read through this, you saw a little bit of the transition. When we got into chapter 7, he started talking about the wide gate and the straight gate. He started talking about doing the will of the Father, believing on him. Because I think what happened, like I said, is it was disciples learning, and then all of these people, the multitudes, started to show up and started to hear the latter parts of this message that Christ was setting forth. And they were astonished at his doctrine. But believers ought not be astonished. They ought to hear his doctrine and say, wow, That is good. That is right. Even if they don't necessarily get everything he's saying, they should say, I want to. I want to follow him. I want to believe his words. I want to trust his words. And why were they astonished? The Bible gives us the answer in verse 29. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He taught with the authority given unto him from the Father. He taught righteousness with authority. And that's what you're going to get from the word of God. We need to follow Christ in faith, believing him, trusting him. We need to follow him in righteousness, and whatever he says, simply do it, and we need to follow him as the highest authority in our lives, in all matters of faith and practice, and things that we do in our life. Be taught of Christ. He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and and be taught. Follow me to my feet. Hear the word and do the word is what Christ is trying to highlight unto us. And we ought to always be students. You're never going to get to a point where you've heard enough Bible, learned enough doctrine, understand enough spiritual truth. You will always have something more that you can learn from Christ as the highest authority in your life. Go to the word of God and allow him to teach you if you want to be a fisher of men. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word and uh, the vast.